Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We'll read verses 19 through 22 today. The title of our thoughts is Let the Dead Bury Their Dead. Now that just sounds like a rather morbid title, but it is a command that Jesus gave, and it does have a context. So let's read that context. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. Actually, there's two parts to this command, follow me, and then let the dead bury the dead. We've heard Jesus give the command, follow me, several times before. But the context is always a little bit different. And so here we have a context where following Jesus uh, is to be accompanied with the dead burying the dead. Now, in this situation, Jesus had just visited the house of his disciple, Peter. He found Peter's mother-in-law sick with a fever, and he healed her. And this prompted others to bring sick and demon-possessed people to Jesus for healing. And after relating this event, Matthew quotes Isaiah 53.4, where it is written, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Well, Isaiah's statement is prophetic about the ministry of Jesus. It also speaks to the compassion of Christ. See, Jesus really cares for people, and he wants to meet their needs. Always think about that when you think about Jesus. He really does care for people. And he does want to meet people's needs. And today, Christ has not lost his compassion. It is his will to express his compassion through his earthly body, the church. And he will do that if we will let him. And to some degree, the command we consider today leads us to do just that. The event in our text happened just after the healing at Peter's house, but after Jesus and his disciples had gone to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Apparently, the word of what had happened preceded him, and because of that, a certain scribe came to Jesus. Now, I don't know how the word traveled so fast. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, I mean, it's not that big, but it takes a little while to get from one side to the other. I don't know if, you know, people there, uh, you know, got on their computers and sent emails to their friends over there, got on their cell phones or sent texts or something, uh, carrier pigeons or what, but apparently uh, the word got to the other side. And this certain scribe came to Jesus. So, who was this man? And what is a scribe? The word scribe comes from the Hebrew word safar, meaning to mark, as in making a tally, or to record. As the title of an office, it may date as far back as the time of Joshua. In Joshua 15.15 15, and Judges 1.12, we read how Caleb took certain cities in Judah, and one of them was called Deber, which had previously been named Kirhath Sefer, Sefer being the Hebrew word sulfur. Taking this city was so important that Caleb offered his daughter in marriage to whoever would take the city. Ladies, aren't you glad the world has changed a little bit? <laughs> you weren't just handed off as a piece of merchandise or as a reward. So he uh, offered his daughter to whoever would take the city. His nephew, Othniel, managed to do that, married the daughter, 
And listen, eventually he became the first judge of the Israelites, this man Othniel, who took this city, Kirhoth Sefer. So Sefer, or Sulfur, becomes associated with somebody who is in a position of leadership. So, the meaning given to the title in the time of Jesus was one learned in the law and a teacher of the law. That's what the scribe means when we see it here in this passage. One who has learned in the law. One who teaches the law. And the law being the law of Moses. The office of scribe was instituted with the return of the Jews from Babylon, beginning with the reading of the Pentateuch to the people by Ezra. And from that time, the law of Moses was acknowledged by Israel as the binding rule of life. That was their law, both their religious law and their civil law. In Jesus' time, scribes were really legislators. And the judgment of the rabbinical scribes determined what was valid law. They're the ones who reviewed things and thought about things and said, this is lawful, this is not lawful. They were the ones that made those decisions. And in developing and establishing the law, a law of custom evolved in addition to the law of Moses. See, the Jews of Jesus' time, they had a lot of laws. They had this divinely given law of Moses that was sacred. But they had another body of laws that were explanations of the law of Moses, interpretations of the law of Moses, that were looked upon not as just somebody's idea, but as binding on the people as the law of Moses. In particular, the halacha legalized these particular customs. Merrill Unger writes about the halacha in his Bible dictionary. He writes, they provided for every possible and impossible case, entered into every detail of private family and public life, and with iron logic and bending rigor and most minute analysis pursued and dominated man, turned whither he might, laying on him a yoke which was truly unbearable. That's what uh, Mr. Unger says about the halacha. This is a law. Listen, it provided for not just every possible case, but every impossible case. How do you do that? But that's how minutia-minded the Jewish religion became by the time Jesus came on the scene. And this halacha ruled just everything about everybody's life. You know, the, the law of Moses said uh, to rest on the Sabbath day. But the halacha and other certain uh, books of the law specify how far you could walk, if you could ride it, light a fire or not, could you cook something, could you warm something up, uh, you know, could you clean, could you not clean, could you get your donkey out of a, a hole, could you do this, could you do that. You know, these guys tried to envision everything that could possibly happen. And they felt morally obligated to do this. It wasn't just to make up laws, to make life hard for the people. They were so scrupulous about trying to live for God. They tried to imagine any situation that can happen and have an application of the law of Moses for it. So what had happened? They say, well, look here. Uh, Rabbi so-and-so said such and such about this. And to them, that was the word of God on that subject. So, that's what a scribe is. And this is the kind of man that approached Jesus on this day. 
Now Albert Barnes suggests, it is not improbable that this man who had seen the miracles of Jesus had formed an expectation that by following him he would obtain some considerable worldly advantage. And I had that thought before I read what Dr. Barnes had to say about it, that uh, he wasn't really interested in being a disciple of Jesus for the sake of being a disciple of Jesus. He expected to get something out of it. You see, he was already a prominent person in Jewish culture. He was a scribe. He was a legislator. He was a man who passed judgment on other of the Jewish people. So perhaps by attaching himself to Jesus, he thought maybe he could increase his prominence. People would look up to him more because, well, not only is he a scribe, he's also one of Jesus' disciples. Maybe he even thought he would be able to perform some miracles as Jesus did. Maybe this would rub off on me and I could be the only scribe in Israel that also does miracles. Who knows? Who knows? However, what we do know is that his statement to Jesus was highly idealistic. Listen to what he said. Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, Adam Clark comments on what this man said. He writes, a man who is not illuminated by the Spirit of God thinks himself capable of anything. He alone who is divinely taught knows he can do nothing but through Christ strengthening him. So where do you suppose this scribe stood in relation to what Dr. Clark said? Very idealistic. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll follow you. Well, I don't think the Spirit of God had illuminated him. I think in one sense the, the political and social cash registers were ringing in his mind. And he thought, this is my opportunity to advance myself. Now Jesus' reply may have taken away some of his enthusiasm or at least dampened his expectations. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, he said, Mr. Scribe, your standard of living is very good. Why, why, why would you want to follow me? I am poor. In fact, the wild animals have more material security than do I. So why in your right mind would you want to give up all that you have and follow me? I think Jesus did an end run around him in his logic. And he uh, tackled him when he was least expecting. Furthermore, where was Jesus going? The man said, I will follow you wherever you go. Where was Jesus going? The scribe had no idea that Jesus' ultimate destination was the cross. To follow Jesus, to be his disciple, was to follow him to the cross. And this man had no idea of what that would be in, about. It is true today. It is true then. Anyone that wants to follow Christ, anyone who wants to be a Christian, must realize there is a price to pay. There is a commitment to be made. Well, we have the promise of assurance. 
and the promise of an abundant life in Christ. That abundant life may cost us all our material well-being to live that very life. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we are called to be living sacrifices. The life Jesus lived was a living sacrifice. He did not seek his own comfort or benefit in anything he did. He sought only to do God's will. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That was what drove Jesus. Notice, I, I like the way, what, the way Jesus said it here. He said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish it. How many people start off trying to be a disciple of Jesus? They try to do the will of God, but they pull up short because the going gets rough. Because as they follow Jesus, they begin to see there's a cross out there in front of them, a cross to which they are going themselves. Not just Jesus, not just the preacher, not just the elder, not just the Sunday school teacher. But listen, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I am going to a cross. I will suffer on that cross. I will have to die, in some sense, on that cross. When they realize that, they say, whoa, I think I'll just be a good church member. After all, I put in my tithe. I give my offerings. I'm here every Sunday. I do enough for the kingdom of God. God has to appreciate that. And preacher, you better appreciate that or I'll find me another church to go to where I will be appreciated. It certainly doesn't sound like Jesus' attitude. It does not sound to me like a disciple of Jesus. Albert Barnegans, Barnes again makes an insightful observation on what Jesus said in what we just read. If you remember in the fourth chapter of John, Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And Dr. Barnes says about this, His great object, the great design of his life, was to do the will of God. He came to that place, to this well there in Samaria. He came to that place weary and thirsty and at the usual time for meals, probably, and hungered. Yet an opportunity of good presented itself, and he forgot his fatigue and hunger and found comfort and joy in doing good, in seeking to save a soul. This one great object absorbed all his powers and made him forget his weariness and the wants of nature. The mind may be so absorbed in doing the will of God as to forget all other things. Intent on this, we may rise above fatigue and hardship and want and bear all with pleasure in seeing the work of God advance. We may learn also that the main business of life is not to avoid fatigue or to seek the supply of our temporal wants, but to do the will of God. The mere supply of our temporal necessities, though most men make it an object of their chief solicitude, is a small consideration in the sight of him who has just views of the great design of human life. If you see why we are here, why we are alive, why we resist, the will of God becomes more important to you 
than the necessities of life. And friends, you will be able to rise above those necessities to do the will of God. Immediately after Jesus replied to the scribe, one of Jesus' disciples spoke up with what might appear to be a strange request. Now this disciple is not one of the twelve apostles, but one of the group of disciples that followed, was following Jesus. <laughs> After hearing about the poverty involved in following Jesus, he may have had second thoughts about being a disciple of Jesus. His request was this, let me first go and bury my father. I think that's a reasonable request, don't you? Just think about it, you know, just bury my father. Well, Jesus' response may at first appear to be hard-hearted. <clears throat> Jesus said, follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, before you think unkindly of Jesus, show us where the disciple said his father had passed away. He didn't say, my father just died, let me go bury him and I will follow you. He simply said, let me bury my father. It may be that his father was still living, and this disciple felt he needed to stay close by until his father did pass away. Life and relationships do place responsibilities on us, and taking care of our aged parents is one of those responsibilities. All too many who profess to be disciples of Jesus, however, allow earthly relationships to stand in the way of a truly meaningful relationship with Christ. Again, I point out, Jesus was on his way to Calvary to accomplish God's purpose for sending him into the world. And that purpose was our salvation from sin. So Jesus was telling both the scribe and this disciple, if you really want to follow me, follow me. Talk is cheap. And I believe in Christianity there's just an awful lot of talk. And there's very little following. Go ahead and criticize me if you want for being too judgmental on people. I'm not thinking of any particular individuals, but I just see the, the state of American Christianity. and I just don't see a lot of people who are following Jesus as if they were going to the cross with him themselves. This disciple wanted to follow Jesus and yet still stay in his present circumstance. And Jesus said to him, that can't happen. To be a disciple of Jesus, your circumstances have to change if you follow him. Or perhaps it is better to say it this way. You have to change in your circumstances if you are to follow him. After all, you are headed to the cross if you are truly Jesus' disciple. By this I mean that Christ must take precedence over all relationships, over all events, over all situations in your life. Those things, Jesus said, must die. So, let the dead bury their dead. Again, Albert Barnes gives us some valuable enlightenment on what Jesus is saying. The word dead is used in this passage in two different senses. It is apparently a paradox. 
but it is fitted to convey his idea very distinctly to the mind. The Jews used the word dead often to express indifference towards a thing, or rather to show that the thing has no influence over them. Thus, to be dead to the world, to be dead to the law, to be dead to sin, means that the world, law, and sin have not influence or control over us, that we are free from them, and as though they were not. A body in the grave is unaffected by the pomp and vanity by the gaiety and revelry, by the ambition and splendor that may be near the tomb. Just drop by any cemetery here. And I don't care what kind of celebration or party would be going on around that cemetery. It does not affect the people in the cemetery at all. They just don't care anymore. So, Men of the world are dead to religion. They see not its beauty, hear not its voice, are not won by its loveliness. This is the class of men to which the Savior referred here. Let men, says he, who are uninterested in my work and who are dead in sin, take care of the dead. Your duty is now to follow me. Jesus expands on his thought later in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 39, where he says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. This is not a call to irresponsibility. It is a call to put Christ and your relationship with God ahead of every other relationship you have. In doing so, you won't be abandoning your responsibilities in those relationships. I want you to be aware of that. In fact, you will actually live those relationships in accordance to God's will. If you love God first, then and only then will you learn how to love your father and mother. It is then you will comprehend what it means to be the son or daughter God intended for you to be. And that applies for any other relationship. Husbands and wives, friends, employers and, and uh, employees and so forth like that. With a God-first relationship, we as the body of Christ then will be able to live out the compassion of Christ wants to express to the world through his body, the church. So you may be a very knowledgeable person, such as was the scribe. Or you may be a regular person who is interested in being a Christian. In fact, you may want to be a disciple. Are you willing to be dead to the world, to the law of Moses? to the legalism of some Christian sect, dead to sin. Those are dead things. Rise above them through the grace of God and follow Jesus. And remember, following Jesus always leads to the cross, your cross. Jesus sums up what he said to the people that day in Matthew 10, 38. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So, are you worthy of Christ? <laughs>